Thank you for joining us for another Rush Generations lecture uh, today, March 22nd, 2023. My name is Kim Morley and I am the program coordinator for Rush Generations. And we are delighted to um, we are delighted to have you joining us um, for, for today's lecture. Um, this is brought to you by the Social Work and Community Health Department in Chicago, Illinois. And the title of today's lecture is Healthy Bones and Bodies. And for this lecture, we are delighted to have one of our Rush colleagues sharing his expertise on this topic. First, I wanna begin by thanking today's lecture producer, Hannah Weitzman for all of her uh, support assistance um, with the technical side of producing today's lecture. And also, if you want to watch previous Rush Generations lectures, get notifications of new lectures and videos, please click the subscribe button and turn on your notifications so you don't miss any information. Thank you to those of you who are joining over the phone and on YouTube. Uh, for those listening on YouTube, if you have any questions for our speaker, please type them using the live chat button located in the bottom right side of your screen. Uh, your questions will be answered at the end of the lecture. And for those of you listening over the phone, there will be an opportunity at the end to unmute yourself to ask questions. And now for our presenter today, um, we are delighted to have Dr. Rizvi with us. He is originally from Indianapolis, Indiana and completed his medical school at Marion University in Indianapolis. He completed his residency in family medicine in Grand Blanc, Michigan and a fellowship in geriatrics at Rush where he has stayed on as a provider at the Rush Senior Care Clinic and as part of the fellowship faculty. He has a passion for working to help patients maintain their independence and the use of technology in their health care. Thank you, Dr. Rizvi, for presenting to our Rush Generation and community members, and I will hand it over to you. All righty. Uh, here I am. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, Appreciate the opportunity to kind of present on this topic. Um, it's definitely something that's become quite prevalent um, in the community. So I think it's worthwhile definitely reviewing the things that we can all do at home to kind of address one of the things that affects a lot of us. Um, let me just get my keynote open. And are we good with the screen? Yes, that looks great. Perfect. All righty. Um, so yeah, um, my talk is in regards to healthy bones and just overall healthy body. Um, here, this is kind of an outline of what I hope to go over. One is the importance of bone health um, as on its own. The different risk factors can that can affect our bones. Um, the screening guidance that's recommended for how we should evaluate our bone health as we grow older. Um, as well as things that we can do to maintain as well as improve our overall bone health. And that at the end, we'll have some time for some question and answer. So um, just to get started. So the first topic I have is in regards to just overall uh, the importance of bone health. Um, so there are three major areas why bone health is important. Now, um, three areas include like the decline of bone density with aging as one of the normal processes. As we grow older, our bones do become a little bit weaker. We can potentially become more at risk for developing fractures, especially after falls. Um, and that kind of goes into the second point of the increased risk for fractures. And then between those two things, it can have a significant impact on our mobility as we grow older. And that's definitely one of the things that's a passion of mine is to uh, try to accomplish those things that can help maintain our independence, our mobility as we grow older. You know, there's a lot of one of the big things that I do as uh, part of Rush is that I'm also one of the providers in the Rush at Home program, where we go out into the community and provide pr primary care services. 
And it gives me an opportunity to take a look and see the patients that are within our community and some of the home environments, some of the risk factors, and just understanding how limiting uh, losing uh, our mobility can be for a lot of individuals. So that's why it's one of the big passions of mine to work towards maintaining our mobility as we grow older. And there's definitely gonna be some points that I hope to address as we uh, go through this lecture. Um, overall, the decline in our bone density. So when we think of our bones, the main areas that we're uh, primarily concerned about, you can see it at the bottom is our spine, our hip, our wrists, uh, the humerus bone, which is your upper arm bone, um, the ribs, and then your pelvic bones. You know, individuals can have fractures in their in their feet and their hands, but those are not typically considered to be related to fragility or an area where like significant bone loss would prompt them to be more sensitive to fractures. But these major bones where they kind of maintain our structure are the key areas where we want to address and where we evaluate when we're looking at our bone density and our overall health. And so one of the big things with us as we age is that our bones do become uh, quite a bit weaker as we grow older. And part of that can be related to a decrease in activity and uh, a decrease in strength. Um, for women, they do tend to have a higher level of uh, bone density decline um, over time. Part of that is related to hormonal changes and in particular after menopause. Um, you know, as uh, women go through uh, menopause, their bodies are no longer producing some of the hormones that prompt the continuous exchange of the cells that develop our bones, and that can make them more brittle over time. And so that can be a major factor. Um, other factors include poor control of, say, thyroid disease. Um, a lot of individuals do take uh, thyroid replacement, but it's very important to make sure that they're maintaining in the appropriate range because too much or too little can have a significant impact on our bone densities. And along with that would be um, related to diabetes, which that as well can have an impact on our overall bone density. Um, the increased risk for fractures comes from the fact that if you have less bone density, your bones can be more brittle. If you think about something being more brittle, it's more easy to shatter or to break. And that's where we have the concern and kind of our structural bones, again, with the spine, the hip, the pelvis, and um, within our extremities. And going with the importance of bone health is um, kind of the impact it can have on our overall mobility. Um, one of the main uh, frameworks that we look at when we're addressing individuals, at, especially as we grow older, is the four M's framework. Um, the four M's include things such as what matters, the medication, our mentation, or our cognitive ability to understand, as well as our mobility. Bone health can primarily be focused on the mobility, but it has an impact on the other domains as well, because if our we have difficulty with mobility, that can lead to our difficulties with being able to get out, being able to do our follow-ups, and may lead to increased need for medications for, say, pain, um, and it can have an overall impact. And that's why this is a very important uh, part for the framework that we want to be able to address as well. Um, pretty much a sedentary lifestyle is always going to have an impact and it's very important to develop good habits as we continue to grow older. Um, so even at a young age, maintaining uh, a regular uh, regimen of being able to get up, move around and keeping that going even as we grow older is very important. Um, the risk factors that we have for our overall bone health. Um, <clears throat> so this is kind of a, a brief summary list of the things that can have major impact on our overall bone health. Things like increasing age, as we kind of discussed um, in particular for females, um, typically the point where we really want to start looking at our uh, nutrition and things that I will go over in a future slide, but for women is typically above the age of 50. And for men, it's typically above the age of 70. Those are major points where we start really looking at, you know, making sure we're maintaining the things to have appropriate bone health. Um, again, the female gender, unfortunately, just with the uh, change in our hormonal uh, status as we uh, grow older and undergo menopause does increase the risk. And I'll go over what the guidelines are for screening in women um, as uh, in a future slide. 
um, low and high BMI or body mass index. So maintaining healthy weight is always going to be important um, for maintaining um, our overall bone health. Um, smoking can have a significant factor. Um, the big risk with smoking is that it reduces some of the blood flow and the turnover in the bones, uh, in the cells of the bones, um, and that can significantly increase the risk for developing fractures. And much the same with alcohol use can have an impact on the calcium absorption within our body. And so those are two major modifiable risk factors for individuals as we continue to grow older in maintaining our uh, healthy bone health. Um, low physical activity, and I'll go over some of the things that would be recommended for maintaining our bone health. Um, recurrent falls, nocturia, those are just risk factors for developing fractures. If we're frequently finding ourselves having difficulty with being able to walk or having frequent falls within the home or outside, as well as having a consistent issue with needing to use the restroom at night or what nocturia is, is needing to use the restroom at night can increase the risk for potentially having a fall and leading to a fracture, which can be a major risk factor for our overall bone health. And then um, chronic kidney disease over time, our kidneys are responsible for partially absorbing and uh, getting rid of some of the calcium that our body takes in. And so with chronic kidney disease, that balance can be thrown off and that can potentially lead to a worsening of our bone health. <clears throat> Other medications that can have a significant uh, impact include corticosteroids or steroid medications. So, for example, you know, certain individuals do need it for, say, arthritis or for a pulmonary dysfunction. But over time, they can have a significant impact in um, inhibiting some of the bone turnover, and that can lead to making the bones brittle and potentially decreasing our bone densities. Uh, other anticonvulsant medications, antipsychotic medications have similar side effects, as well as like individuals that are on continuous heparin or lithium for mood or thyroxine or levothyroxine, sorry, for our thyroids. So these are some of the medications that do have an impact. And, you know, recognizing that if certain individuals are on these medicines, it's important to look at the things that we can do to modify our bone, our, our lifestyle and our regimen to uh, potentially make our bone health stronger then. Uh, the screening guidance. Um, so for now, uh, the recommendation for most individuals when you see your primary care physician for uh, checking on bone density is for women primarily at the age of 65 and older. Uh, the typical diagnose, diagnostic um, application that we use is called a DEXA scan or dual energy x-ray absorptiometry scan. So I had to look up the full definition each time because it is quite long, but uh, we'll just go with DEXA scan. But it's similar to like an x-ray imaging where you are found, uh, you stand um, and the image is done to evaluate the density within our structural bones. Um, the main goal that we have for this is to diagnose if an individual has low bone mass or at the level of what we consider to be osteopenia or osteoporosis. Osteoporosis and osteopenia are differentiated by just the level of uh, severity in regards to our density with osteoporosis being the worst. And what that means is that it just indicates you are at a significantly high risk for potentially developing fractures. Um, for men, there's no formal recommendation per se to get regular screening with a DEXA scan. Um, but one of the things we do look for is if we started noticing on the ex annual exam that we're noticing a trend towards a decrease in height can be a major factor in men to have an evaluation for their bone density. So what are some of the things that we can do to improve our bone health? So the things that we want to look at uh, can pertain to three major areas, uh, one of them being uh, nutrition. <clears throat> uh, we want to make sure that everyone has a healthy, balanced diet, but in particular, as we grow older, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, as we grow older, um, for women in particular above the age of 50 and for men greater than 70, we want to make sure that we're maintaining a daily intake of calcium of approximately 1,200 milligrams per day. 
And then as well for vitamin D, we want to keep that between 800 to 1,000 units per day. Um, obviously, those numbers can vary based on other, you know, say pre-existing conditions and such, but that's the typical guidance for how much nutrition we need to maintain. Um, the other factors that we can do to avoid um, worsening our bone health is to avoid smoking, avoid alcohol use, um, and avoiding a prolonged use of certain medications, as we discussed before, such as the corticosteroids and such. Um, and then lastly, exercise is going to be a major factor. And so let's go through some of the things um, between the nutrition and the exercise that, I, uh, that can help our bone densities. Um, with nutrition, this is just a, <clears throat> a overall chart of um, kind of the calcium that's present in different common food groups, just to give us an example. So um, if you say, look at an orange, it has about 60 milligrams of calcium, uh, milk, skim, 2% or whole, about eight ounces has about 300 milligrams of calcium. And you can see kind of this range with like orange juice with calcium. You can consider this in your diet when you're deciding or evaluating if you're taking in enough calcium within a day. Um, certain individuals would benefit from taking a calcium supplement. Those can vary in the amount of dosage, but typically around a 500 milligrams of that and then maintaining the rest through just overall diet is what uh, I have typically recommended. But that's, this is definitely something that can be looked at uh, when you're looking at your diet of how much calcium you may be taking in. And so this is a chart from the American Bone Health, which is a uh, great organization for uh, finding resources relating to our overall bone health. Um, and what this is demonstrating is osteogenetic loading. But one of the big things in our bone health is that uh, resistance training or uh, being on weight bearing is going to provide the most benefit for reversing as well as improving our overall bone density. So what that means is that on this chart, you can kind of see that like swimming and cycling, those are great exercises, great for the heart, great for our overall body, but they don't necessarily provide a load. And so they don't necessarily improve our bone density or our bone health uh, just by focusing on those. The things that can increase our bone health as we go up are, say, doing brisk walks daily, that's providing a load on our hips, on our uh, major structural bones, uh, increasing that to running and jogging uh, will provide a greater load and can potentially benefit in greater bone density. And then obviously jumping and strength, strength training are uh, going to be even higher than that. And so that's kind of how we evaluate. Now, it's not to say that every individual needs to be going out and starting to lift weights or, um, you know, doing some drastic exercising, but just take this as a guide for like recognizing what you may be doing now and what may be a step above that can improve potentially our bone health. Things such as uh, yoga or Pilates, those two can uh, incorporate parts that uh, require a greater amount of loading on our bones, and that would fit for potentially benefiting our overall bone densities. So again, the website that I have uh, for everyone to uh, look at for resources, they also include uh, exercise regimens are the American Bone Health. Um, that's a great resource. And then otherwise, definitely, uh, you know, checking in with your primary care doctor for um, making sure that you're up to date on your bone screening, or if you may potentially be a candidate for getting a screen uh this is one of the important things and one of the things that really is modifiable and can be improved upon. Uh, and so I think it's definitely an area that should be focused upon. And so those are that's kind of the summary of my slides. So we can definitely take some questions and I will exit out of my presenting. Thank you so much, Dr. Rizvi. Um, that was you know, a wealth of knowledge um, uh, in a very compact, you know, um, um, amount of time and just gave us a lot to uh, learn and think about. Um, for those who are uh, calling into this lecture, um, you can unmute yourself to ask Dr. Rizvi any questions by dialing star six. And we'll give, um, those folks a chance and then on YouTube as well, um, there is that, that delay. And so we'll get to those um, uh, questions after our callers.
Um, and as we're doing that, one of the areas I didn't cover just because it's kind of further down the road was like the medications that say your bone density is at a point that you need some greater intervention. And so that in itself is definitely something that should be discussed with your primary provider, but there are different you know, categories of medications that can be worked towards as well. So that's something else that I didn't necessarily touch on, but um, just know that that's uh, also a part of our overall bone health. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, one uh, one question that did come up is um, you had mentioned um, like, uh, you know, a decrease in height as a potential indicator of, um, uh, you know, a decrease in bone density. And I, I feel like that is sometimes that stereotype of like, oh, I feel like my uh, parents are, are um, you know, or I'm taller than my, I'm getting taller than my parents or something like that. Um, are What are like any other maybe like, uh, uh, I guess, external risk um, or, or signs of, of, you know, decrease in bone density? Yeah, of course. Um, so just for the loss of height, um, the big reason for that is that if we're finding that there's compression within the spine, that can be a direct indicator for why you're having a decrease in height. And that can correlate with weakness uh, of the bone structure. And that's why we use that as a correlation for getting checked for our bone density. Um, the other factors, uh, the main ones, so our structural bones are truly meant to be quite strong. Like, you know, the, the femur bone of our legs is one of the uh, most dense bones within our body, uh, our spine, our hip, those are very structural and they're meant to be uh, very strong. So if under any circumstance that like you say have a fall and you develop a fracture, fracture in one of those structural areas, that in itself, even before having any kind of bone density screening, can be an indication that your bone density is low. And so um, typically, if anyone has had that kind of fracture, um, it's recommended that once you know, you've know you gone through the healing process of everything, that you have a proper evaluation for your bone density, as you may potentially be a candidate or be in a range where we do need to consider some form of intervention. Wonderful. Thank Hello. you. Hello. I have yes. a question. Thank you yeah. for Go sharing ahead. this information, doctor. Um, you said exercise helps increase bone density, but what is the process of that? How does that actually work? So yeah, uh, a big yeah. part of just improving our bone density with exercise is partially related to the load. The greater the load, the more like in a way you're getting blood flow, much the same way in your muscles, the more you say you're working on your arms or your legs, you're gonna be increasing your blood flow to those parts of your body. It's much the same way for your bones as well. So the areas that you're providing the load is offering a, a chance for the cells to be more stimulated, to be uh, more active and replacing uh, our bone structure and building it up. And so it's kind of the same process for our bones as well. And so doing things that are going to be providing a load is the way that we typically stimulate much the same, like doing, you know, working on our biceps, uh, using dumbbells, those are going to stimulate like your muscles there, but much the same way, the different exercises that are providing a load on our bones for our hips or uh, our legs are going to stimulate those bones and uh, are going to help them grow stronger. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. I have a question. Hello. Yeah. Uh, can can osteoporosis be managed without medication? Thank you. Yeah. So um, the question is, uh, can osteoporosis be managed without medications? When we look at when we're um, diagnosing an individual as having, you know, the different stages, you can have, you know, normal bone mass. You can have low bone mass. You can have osteopenia, which is uh, a level above that. And then osteoporosis is kind of the end stage where we pass the threshold where we truly are at greater risk. Um, typically trying to manage osteoporosis without um, medications can be difficult because we've kind of gone so far along uh, the road of where our bone density is just very weak. Now, the things that we do to improve our bone density, you know, avoiding the risk factors, um, you know, doing exercises, those are true, those are meant to maintain and they can reverse to a certain extent. Um, but once you're at the stage of osteoporosis, it can be very difficult to kind of, you know, reverse that trend. 
more commonly um, within osteopenia or the stage beforehand, even within uh, that range, there may come a point where it may be recommended to do some therapy or some medication to prevent the further decline. Um, but within osteopenia, it's more likely that you may be able to, with exercise, with maintaining your nutritional intake, that you may be able to reverse the process enough that you don't have to consider uh, necessary uh, pharmacologic therapy. But once you get into the osteoporosis range, it's very difficult just because your bones are truly uh, quite weak. And even after, you know, starting pharmacologic therapy, you still, you know, as best you're able to maintain doing exercise and doing those things to avoid worsening and improving our bone health are going to be important. Um, but that does bring up another question that I'm sure that um, some of you may have is that, you know, should we, does just taking calcium and vitamin D on its own just prevent um, necessarily like a decline in our bone density? And it, it's not necessarily that it's going to prevent. It's very important. It's one of the major steps in the process, but truly like maintaining our physical activity and, you know, being able to uh, uh, be active and provide that load on our bones is truly what maintains our bone health. Uh, so even within osteoporosis, if you're just taking calcium and vitamin D, it doesn't necessarily uh, reverse the process either. Thank you. The um, only reason I bring it up is because there are some concerns I have about some of the medications and their side effects. Can you comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I, I do hear very commonly um, about some of those concerns, and they're true concerns because these medicines can have uh, a lot of risks. The first line medications that we typically go to are the bisphosphonates for osteoporosis. Uh, they help stimulate and improve our bone density, but they do have the risk for uh, potentially damaging our esophagus or uh, potentially uh, affecting the bones of our jaw. When we're prescribing those medicines, we do you know, want to take into account the different risk factors that some of these medicines have. There are injectable kinds that you know, once every six months, just doing that can uh, has less of those side effects as compared to the bisphosphonates. Um, but I think it's true that a lot of these medicines or really all of the medicines within the category for uh, treating osteoporosis do uh, contain certain risks. So I think it's about finding the right uh, mix of medicines. The bisphosphonates are typically done once a week. Um, you know, the biggest side effect is in again, in regards to affecting the esophagus. So we recommend, you know, making sure you're sitting up for at least half an hour to an hour after taking it. And when you're taking, you take it with a full glass of water. Um, those are uh, important uh, factors for taking that medicine. But then there is definitely certain individuals that have a hard time swallowing or have acid reflux and put them at greater risk. So that's not the right medicine. And so we can go to other medicines or um, that can uh, better align with their previous risk factors. So I think there's, you know, there's definitely a risk and it's more so, uh, or not just about like, you know, the first line is this medicine, so we have to do this and then we have to do that. I think it's about finding the right medicine from the get-go that fits with your potential risk factors and that most aligns that you are able to tolerate. Thank you. I believe I see that there's one other caller that has unmuted themselves. Um, if, if you want to uh, ask a question over the phone to Dr. Rizvi, please, please feel free to do so. We do have two questions that came in to, through the YouTube chat. Uh, the first one is, if you have osteopenia in the spine and hips, are there any exercises that should be avoided? Yeah, um, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, there's definitely um, certain exercises that, you know, develop greater force um, within our bone structures. So the areas that we do have weakness, we want to balance it out by 
offering like appropriate exercise that provides a load versus like exercise that may be, you know, too much to necessarily handle for your structure. And so um, one of the areas that as I was kind of preparing for this lecture as well that I was looking into is that there's definitely for um, certain stages, say in um, in yoga, certain poses do provide too much of a force uh, on certain parts of the body. So say you had um, within your hips or the, the neck of your um, hip bone um, that we would typically recommend avoiding. Um, the biggest thing with any kind of exercise is also a matter of like what you feel you're comfortable with and what you're able to handle because any exercise can be pushed to a greater extreme. So it's, so I think it's less so about certain exercises that you avoid is recognizing when you're doing an exercise, if it feels like it's causing more pain than anything else, or if it's, you know, to an extent, like, uh, beyond what you feel, uh, you're able to stretch to, or, uh, get your body into position for those are definitely things to avoid and much the same like you know having those weaknesses say you're doing some resistance based training or like weightlifting you never want to use more weight than you feel comfortable with or you feel like you can handle because that's really what's going to be the factor for you is to you know you should do those exercises but you should feel comfortable as you're doing them so it doesn't mean that you're needing to necessarily use a lot of weight or feel like you're, you know, overextending yourself or you're trying to build a lot of muscle at, uh, immediately. You want to take it as slowly and take it as a balance with what you feel comfortable with. And should um, folks also ask their um, uh, doctors to what might be like safe or um, things that they should avoid, like, you, you know, given that each person's situation might be a little different? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, definitely, you know, consulting with your primary care physician or your specialist, whoever may be managing it to see, you know, what, um, what certain activities are that you should avoid. Um, you know, I guess one of the biggest activities that typically we recommend is any kind of exercise that has like, you know, very jarring movements or like immediate movements. Those are, I guess, considered some of the highest risk under any circumstance. But again, it goes to what you feel comfortable with. Um, if it's something that you've been able to do before and have been consistently doing in regards to an exercise, then that should be okay. But if at any point you feel that you know, I'm doing something and it just doesn't feel the same, it feels more painful, that's a indication that you need to dial back because it may be causing more harm than anything. Um, I think we have another caller that unmuted themselves. I think they raised their hand to ask a question. Okay. Um, feel free to go ahead. Hi, uh, hi, doctor. I, I got on Zoom or to, to this. I could ask a question. Um, so I'm 67 at 50. I did a year of Menistar patch. The doctor. So I'm curious about the doctor. Recent, my gynae recently said a few years ago. Had I known how bad your bones would be, I would have kept you on hormones. Um, your thoughts on the about if that is was worth it, and it's probably too late at 67. Um, to to go back to that. Also, when um, calcium is pumped into such things as orange juice, where we know it doesn't occur naturally, is that any better than taking a pill? Yeah, of course. Um, just to summarize your question, um, partly you've been on hormone therapy, but you were recommended to have like continued on it earlier. Was that I, well, I was I was on it at 50 for like a year and something with my liver enzymes. So then I have not taken it. Now I'm 67. I did Forteo. I'm border between October osteopenia, depending on the body part. Yeah. And um, and so I'm I'm just, you know, doing DEXA scans and I did have reclass, et cetera. But just wondering um, your thoughts about hormones in this. And also, obviously, I've been told diet is better. But um, is it really dietary if it's pumped into such things as orange juice? Yeah, of course. Um, so the big thing is um, with hormone therapy is that physiologically speaking, it does, you know, affect our bone density, especially in women. So, you know, being on hormone replacement, does it benefit your bones? In a way it does, but the hormones themselves are also affecting a lot of other parts of the body and they carry a lot of risk so as you're you mentioned that like you know it can affect the liver it can affect you know our breast tissues and things like that so you know it's always about balancing 
I think the common or the most um, accepted consensus is that you, know, you shouldn't necessarily use hormone therapy and it, on its own just for bone health. So yeah, think, yeah, yeah. So I think that's a that's the main part of it. But it also speaks to as you know, in particular, women are going through the transition through like menopause and their hormones are changing. You know, really taking the time to evaluate the things that can improve our bone density. So like the parts of like making sure our nutrition is well balanced, uh, doing the exercises to you know maintain, those are going to be the most effective. Now, um, in regards to like having calcium pumped into orange juice, um, I'll say growing up, I drank a lot of calcium or orange juice with calcium. Um, the body should be able to absorb um, what it needs and excrete what it doesn't. So if you're taking in a lot more calcium than uh, what you really need, you should typically be able to, you know, in a way, pee it out. The risk is if you're prone oh. to make uh, kidney stones or things like that, that's always a risk factor. Um, but typically having calcium in your orange juice uh, should be absorbed at a similar rate as like taking anything else uh, orally. But I mean, is it the equivalent of taking a calcium pill or is it more like a food source like yogurt that doesn't have calcium pumped in? Um, there shouldn't necessarily be any difference um, in regards to the way it's absorbed between the different food groups. I think what you may find is sometimes thrown off is you may see like calcium tablets that have like, you know, a thousand milligrams of calcium in it. Is your body truly absorbing that full thousand milligrams? Probably not. You know, you're, you're not. Oh, no, because no, no, yeah. I know that. But I just thought that to me, orange juice is no better than taking a pill because mm -hmm. it doesn't occur naturally, unlike yogurt and stuff. And like orange juice on its own does have some calcium, like even the oh. not fortified, uh, and even the fruit, like calcium, uh, orange juice or oranges do have some calcium. A little um, bit. Okay. Yeah. It's not to the so, level, obviously you are correct in saying that like, you know, orange juice with calcium is, you know, it's artificially added. That is true. But the absorption, the way the body absorbs, that shouldn't be any different than with any other food group. So, Doctor, you're saying no more pickleball. Is that what you're telling us? <laughs> if you're doing pickleball and you're really good at it, you should keep doing it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, uh, kind of going off of the nutrition part, um, for those of us who just aren't able to tolerate dairy, um, like yogurt, milk, cheese, um, is is it okay to be using like, you know, fortified almond milk or, you know, soy milk? Are those um, uh, okay replacements? Yeah, uh, they absolutely are um, appropriate because um, a lot of those other like uh, alternates like, you know, oat milk or almond milk and um, like those in themselves have calcium. So it's just getting it from a different source and using those alternatives is completely appropriate. Because once again, like things that you're, you know, eating and drinking, um, the body should be absorbing them in a similar process. It's true that like some things that are fortified with additional may not completely be absorbed or not all of it gets absorbed, but that can be said for a lot of different food, um, you know, groups. So it's just all about balance, you know, recognizing. And that's why we also, you know, will be doing those checks of like making sure your calcium level itself is in the appropriate range. If we find that you eat a certain way and your calcium is not necessarily where we want it to be, that's an indication that, okay, where can we add more calcium sources or should you be taking an additional calcium supplement? Um, that's typically how we want to look at it. But, you know, using alternatives based on, you know, dietary restrictions, say, you are unable to eat, say, meat, or if you are lactose intolerant, there's always alternatives that we can balance uh, your diet out with. Wonderful. Um, there is one other YouTube question that came in um, that asks, will wearing Velcro arm and ankle weights help while walking on the treadmill to get that uh, like load type of exercise? Um, yeah, it, it definitely, you know, it's applying a load both to your arms, um, it's applying a load to your legs. So it definitely can. Um, the one thing I will say, because there are so many variations on different exercises and different modalities that, you know, I may not have the full experience with, um, the ankle weights. Yes, they definitely do. 
but everything should be done within reason. Like you should, again, never feel like you're pushing yourself too hard as you're doing certain exercises. But yeah, any kind of addition of weight, say even using, you know, holding dumbbells while you're using the treadmill or like doing uh, the bicep curls on the treadmill, um, you know, that's another way of like adding additional load. Um, so those are appropriate ways for, you know, um, adding or, um, you know, leveling up kind of the exercises that you are doing. Okay, nice. Thanks. Um, there's another YouTube question that came in that says, should females over 70 years old have hormone levels checked? Um, uh, the specific caller said that she had high estrogen levels at the age of 50. Um, that's a good question. Um, not typically, you know, as you get older, a lot of your hormonal levels should be declining. Um, if you do have levels that are still elevated, it should typically present itself with other symptoms as well, whether it's say flushing or like just, um, you know, the things that you may have experienced at the prior age or uh, notice like say hot flashes or things like that. So I would expect you to have other symptoms as well um, as an indication for needing to have those uh, types of things checked. But again, uh, you know, uh, part of it also is each individual's history can be different. So if there's, you know, prior concern for elevated hormonal levels, then that may be an indication that you should be, you know, periodically having them checked. Or uh, again, if you're not necessarily having symptoms, so that it can vary a lot more. And that's definitely something to discuss with your primary care for that. Um, but again, it's, you know, it just depends on each individual. Okay, so yeah, that just relates to maybe a case by case basis, but um, there isn't like some kind of standard uh, practice yeah. right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no necessary like formal practice that like every individual at a certain age needs to have, say, the hormonal levels checked. Great, sounds good. Um, well, I just want to give everybody uh, one last chance to be able to ask Dr. Rizvi a question. Um, the callers, please feel free to press uh, star six to unmute yourself. And um, we'll give things about one more minute. And after that, move on to our Rush Generations programs and promotions. See a hand wave. Doctor, um, is coffee, I mean, just a cup in the morning or a strong cup in the morning bad? And um, I have been, I am like 118 pounds, five, three, uh, that a little extra weight is helpful because it tugs on the bones and that um, would help you in a fall, um, you know, not to be too thin. Yeah, well, what I'll say is that I haven't had a coffee yet today and i'm starting to feel the effects of a headache <laughs> um, i'm gonna say uh you know not having coffee is a bad thing or to have coffee is a good thing um i think that's that's the case by case um but clearly i i need some coffee so um but in regards to the weight um one of the risk factors is having a lower body mass index can yeah be risk, but it also depends on you know certain individuals say you know having been professional athletes or uh very active um you know they will have lower bone mass does that mean that their bone density will directly correlate with being lower not necessarily so that as well as kind of a case by case um that would require like evaluating kind of more of the history but yeah. you found that your weight has always been on the lower side and that's kind of how you maintain then and potentially if it it does sound like it's a little bit on the lower side for the uh body mass index then, well that may be a risk factor that we would want to you know consider or talk about once it's time that uh to be evaluated with the bone density scan but one strong cup of coffee at like 7 a.m um should not impact bones it shouldn't necessarily impact bones okay uh, yeah. okay Thank you. And again, every, you know, everything can have an effect on different parts of the body for sure. You know, the big thing we think of ca uh, coffee is the caffeine aspect, but you know, other parts, but um, as a rule, there isn't anything strictly saying that like coffee negatively correlates with bone health. 
I think that's a relief for all of us to hear, um, those, those of us who are coffee drinkers. So, um, well, great. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. Rizvi. Uh, this has been an absolute pleasure to have you talk to our Rush Generations community. Um, I know for me, just like learning that there is still a lot like within our control when it comes to managing our bone health um, with some things, it's just like, you know, age can uh, uh, take over and it's something, you know, outside of our control, we're all aging, but um, in regards to our bone health, just having those practical tools uh, to be able to rely on um, to, to maintain healthy bones um, is, is great. So thank you so much. Yeah, no, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, and yeah, definitely just reinforcing the fact that like, no matter what, you know, there are a lot of things that are still in our control and we can make changes at really any age. So um, I was just, I'm glad that I've had the opportunity to speak with everyone. Yes, thank you again. Take care. All righty, thank you. So for our final portion of the lecture today, we want to share with you the current and upcoming Rush Generations programs that we are offering. And to start off with first is our Tai Chi for arthritis and fall prevention. And that is coming up on April 19th and running through June 9th. That will be on Wednesdays and Fridays between 11 a.m. and 12 p.m. And this workshop helps participants improve balance while fostering mindfulness. And the other benefits of Tai Chi include relief of pain and stiffness, reduced stress, and improvement in quality of life. And these one hour sessions have uh, demonstrated a 47% reduction in falls. Um, and the exercises can be modified for seated positions um, if that's your uh, you know, current level um, of activity. So um, we encourage you to call our 800 number as space is limited and registration is required for this. Next class is our Embracing Aging, and that will start next Monday, March 27th, and run through May 15th from 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. There's a total of eight sessions, which uh, cost a total of $40, um, although there are some scholarship opportunities for partial and full scholarships. So we encourage you to call us and inquire more about that. Um, a little bit more information about this class is that it's designed to improve muscle strength, range of movement, balance and activities for daily living. And there is um, uh, both seated exercises as well as um, standing exercises, just based on whatever modifications you may need. Also starting next, or I'm sorry, tomorrow um, is our gentle chair yoga class. And that will be at 11 a.m. tomorrow. And it runs for one hour every Thursday until May 11th. And similar to our um, uh, Embracing Aging class, there are eight sessions total that are $40 um, uh, altogether. Um, but we have those scholarship opportunities to be able to offer you um, as we would love to have you join this. Uh, just a little bit more information about our gentle chair yoga class. Um, it's, you know, for anybody, whether you're a novice to yoga or you've practiced it in the past, um, these, the poses that are practiced can be modified as well um, for sitting, um, standing, or even in a chair. And uh, similar to what Dr. Rizvi was saying, um, is that just, you know, you're able to listen to your body and, and um, be able to do the exercises that, that feel most comfortable for you. Um, so to get more information about this um, and to register, please call our 800 number. Next is our Health Legacy Program for Women. This is a free six-week workshop designed for women of color that covers emotional support, exercise, healthy cooking, and nutrition in a supportive environment. 
And this next workshop that we're offering starts April 13th and runs every Tuesday and Thursday until May 25th from 4 to 6 p.m. in the afternoon or evening. And this program is offered virtually and registration is required. So please call our 800 number and we would love to get you registered for this class. And another one of our groups that is coming back now that the weather is improving is our Walk With Ease walking group. And this will be in person at the Garfield Park Conservatory uh, starting April 12th, which is a Wednesday and running every Wednesday, Thursday and Friday until May 19th from 1 p.m. till 2.30 p.m. And a little bit more information about this, um, that this group is actually offered through the Arthritis Foundation and uh, that the walks are at your own pace and can range anywhere from 10 minutes to 45 minutes. And individuals living with arthritis, osteoporosis, chronic pain, or other conditions are encouraged to participate. Um, however, you don't need a health care, or I'm sorry, a health condition to participate. Anyone who would just want to connect with others and become more active is welcome to join. Um, so uh, same thing with this, registration is required. So our 800 number is listed there for you to call and get set up. Uh, next is our uh, offerings of support groups to our community. And the first is our friends and family of people with memory loss support group. Um, and this group is offered every second uh, Monday of the month. The next group will be in April on Monday, April 10th. And this is at uh, 6 p.m. till 7.30 p.m and is offered over the phone. Um, and for more information or to register for this group, please reach out to Janine Quinn at 312-563-0650. And then we also have our diabetes education and support group. And this is every third Thursday of the month. Uh, our next session is next April uh, 20th from 2 to 3 p.m. And this is via a Zoom conference call. And you can get registered for that uh, with our by calling our 800 number. Um, next is our friendly a caller program through Senior Connections. And this is for anyone who's interested in receiving a friendly weekly call from a trained volunteer and can be a, a conversation that you have with someone on any topic of, of your interest. And the calls can be as short um, or up to an hour long. And um, to get you connected with that, please call our 800 number and we can get you assigned to someone. Additionally, we have our Rush Caring for Caregivers program, and this is education and support to family caregivers who are taking care of adults that are 60 and older. Um, so for more information or to request an assessment, please call our caregiver, um, our Caring for Caregiver phone number at 312-563. 0350. Additionally, we are continuing to uh, promote our older adult home modification program. And this is for homeowners that are 62 and older and living on the west side of Chicago. There's a variety of, of different interventions that this program provides. So uh, to get a better understanding of that um, and hear more of the details, please call 312-942-6400. And lastly, as uh, we always discuss, is our Shalman Senior Voices program. And this program wants to learn about what matters most to older adults. And one of the ways we do that is by having you record a video 
for uh, our community to, um, or for us to share with our community um, so that we can all learn from each other on what matters most as we age um, and to be able to educate uh, the next generation of, of healthcare providers in how they're caring for uh, older adults. And one way you can do that is by uh, using your smartphone and taking a picture of the QR code here uh, or by the website address that is listed right above that QR code. And we are excited to offer uh, our next lecture on Wednesday, April 8th at uh, 1 p.m. And this will be on back and neck pain. Um, so please join us next month for our next lecture. And um, if you are interested in any further information about the programs I just reviewed or to register for any programs specifically, please call our 800 number, which is 1-800-757-2000. And regarding the health information that you've received today, if you have any further questions, please do not hesitate to ask your primary care provider about this information. And we wish you a very uh, healthy rest of your day. And until our next lecture, I hope you take care.